welcome back to The Basement. I'm Steve Lewis. As you'll recall from our last exciting episode, in late 1971 and early 1972, Brian Wilson, along with co-writer and co-producer David Sandler, had worked on producing an album for his wife and sister-in-law, Marilyn and Diane Ravel, who were billed as Spring. The excellent self-titled album, Spring, was released in July 1972. Unfortunately, neither the album nor its two singles, Now That Everything's Been Said and Good Time, made much impact on the charts, and United Artists dropped Spring from the label. This did not mean the end of the Spring Project, however. In early 1973, of course, the Beach Boys, including Brian and their families, decamped to Holland to begin recording what would eventually become, in 1973, the Beach Boys' Holland album. Meanwhile, co-producer and co-writer David Sandler went to his old stomping grounds in Fort Dodge, Iowa, where he got together with some musician friends and recorded some demos for Spring with an eye toward getting them a new record contract. Among the songs he recorded was a song called Shyin' Away, which he sent on a cassette to Brian and company in Holland. Shortly after returning from Holland, Brian, along with Marilyn, Diane, and David Sandler, all went to Fort Dodge, Iowa to record more demos with an eye toward getting a recording contract for spring. David Sandler says that they wanted to go to Fort Dodge because they were looking for that rural feeling. Apparently they didn't have enough rural feeling in Holland, or they wanted to keep that vibe going, so they went to Fort Dodge, where they recorded demos, including Shyin' Away, Fallen in Love, a David Sandler song called Snowflakes, Had to Phone Ya, which eventually became a track on Beach Boy's 15 Big Ones, and possibly It's Like Heaven, which is a song that may have come later, but some sources say that it was also recorded during these sessions. It worked out. Spring, now called everywhere in the world American Spring, including in the U.S., was signed to Columbia Records. Things seemed to move pretty rapidly after that, and on April 6, 1973, Columbia Records released the American Spring single, Shyin' Away, with Fallen in Love as the B-side, prominently credited to produced by Brian Wilson and David Sandler. The A-side ultimately is credited to Sandler, Brian Wilson, and Diane Ravel. Shine Away was a beautiful choice for a single A-side. It's beautifully produced, very upbeat, very catchy without being overly simplistic. It should have done great on AM radio. Though it is a step away from the ethereal sound that Spring had on their 1972 album. The B-side is the same song that Dennis Wilson released as Lady in 1970. It's been rewritten just slightly to be sung by women. Basically, they've replaced the word lady with the word baby and retitled the song Fallen in Love. Shine Away and Fallen in Love made a great single, and though it's probably a little less adventurous musically than the Spring album, this American Spring single rates right up there with some of Brian Wilson's finest work. The single did not do well, failed to chart. Once again, Columbia dropped them. The single now is very difficult to come by. It can be found, among other places, on this 2003 CD, Pet Projects, the Brian Wilson Productions, along with some other really interesting and really worthwhile Brian Wilson work. Following the commercial failure of the American Spring single and being dropped by Columbia Records, the American Spring Project seemed to go on hold for about four years. Now, here's where the story really gets complicated. Early in 1977, American Spring was revived by Marilyn and Diane with the unlikely addition of Rushton Rocky Pamplin, who had been a college football player, had been drafted by the New Orleans Saints in 1971, though he apparently was cut in preseason and never actually played in a pro game. He was also a former Playgirl model, and between the firing and rehiring of Gene Landy, Rocky, along with his good friend Stan Love, Mike Love's brother, had been minders for Brian Wilson. I don't want to spend too much time talking about Rocky Pamplin, but suffice to say, for somebody that clearly needed a mental health professional as much as Brian Wilson did in the 1970s, even for that era, it's shocking that Brian would instead get Rocky Pamplin. At best, Rocky comes off as one of the sketchier characters out of the movie Boogie Nights. 
At worst, he comes off as a testosterone-fueled rageaholic. In his book about his time with the Beach Boys, called The Beach Boys' Endless Wave Inside America's Band, you would expect him to cast himself in a good light, but he actually comes off probably worse after reading this book than if you've just heard about him. He kind of reminds me of one of those guys that you occasionally meet who brags about things that any other person would be ashamed of, and you find yourself kind of looking at the door and going, how am I going to get away from this person without setting him off? Rocky is a very, very sketchy dude, and I'm sure many of you know all the stories, so I won't go into them. Anyway, they recorded It's Like Heaven with Rocky. They did a version of California Feelin', apparently with Rocky on lead vocal, which I've never heard, and I'm sure I'm really not missing anything. Also around this time, they recorded a cover version of Elvis Presley's Don't Be Cruel. They had another shot at recording Had to Phone You, though they may have been just overdubbing on the original 1973 version that they had in the can. They did a Marilyn Wilson, Brian Wilson, Diane Ravel original, a very slight tune called Do Ya. And some sources say they also recorded a version of Jimmy Rogers' Honeycomb, though I've never heard that, actually. By early 1978, Rocky Pamplin was out, though he would eventually record his own disco album called The Rock in 1979. The only Beach Boy connection with this album is that he recorded a version of Mike Love and Ron Altbach's Disco Symphony, which was also released on the almost impossible to find Disco Celebration album in 1980. Not only was Rocky out, but Brian Wilson was also out as producer at this point. Marilyn and Brian were going through their final breakup, which Rocky certainly contributed to. They would divorce in 1979, though they would apparently remain on pretty good terms. In 1978, Marilyn and Diane recruited their youngest sister, Barbara, into the lineup and did a series of recordings with Diane as producer. In 1979, Brian returned as producer for just a short time and helped them turn in a disco-fied version of Just Like Romeo and Juliet, which had been a hit for the Reflections in 1964. The only one of these songs that was released in any form at the time was It's Just Like Heaven, which appeared on Sean Cassidy's third studio album, Under Wraps. Released in 1978, on the Sean Cassidy album, It's Like Heaven is credited to Brian Wilson, Diane Ravel, and Rushton Pamplin. Actually, Rushton is spelled with a T-Y-N, and I've never seen it spelled anyplace else except on this album that way. Small point. Sean Cassidy, of course, had come to prominence as a teen heartthrob through his role as Joe Hardy on the Hardy Boys' Nancy Drew Mysteries. In 1977, his first two albums, his self-titled debut, and the album Born Late had produced several top 10 singles. By the time Under Wraps was released in 1978, his recording career was on the decline, as so often happens with teen heartthrobs. This was the first Sean Cassidy album that produced no hits, and there would be no hits from Sean Cassidy going forward. Surprisingly, for an album by a teen heartthrob, It's Like Heaven is one of the few cover versions on this album. Most of these songs here are Sean Cassidy originals. Not surprisingly, Sean Cassidy's version of It's Like Heaven is bubblegum. It's light, it's slight, it's got a very nice synthesizer-based production, however, and is really actually a more fully realized and enjoyable version than the version that was eventually released by Spring. Actually, as Sean Cassidy's recording career wound down, he went in a very interesting and bizarre direction. By 1980, on his fifth and final solo album, having had no hits in a couple of years, he dispensed with his longtime producer, Michael Lloyd, who had a great track record producing bubblegum hits, not only for Sean, but also for the Osmonds for many years, and for Leif Garrett. Mike Lloyd was gone. Instead, Sean brought in Todd Rundgren, who, with members of Utopia, recorded the album Wasp, which was released in September 1980, and it is truly bizarre. It's got an edgy, bleak, new wave feel. Although it's kind of all over the map. It's got some sort of punk stuff. It's got some sort of David Bowie, Eno-esque stuff. I'm not sure who the Wasp album was really meant to appeal to. If you listen to the opening track, which is a cover version of David Bowie's Rebel Rebel, 
with bits of the crystals he's a rebel thrown in for good measure and the whole thing is produced like a track from Bowie's Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. That is not going to appeal to the base bubblegum fans that Sean Cassidy had appealed to in the past and I can't see how it could really appeal to new wave fans either. Maybe it was meant to appeal to ironic hipsters, I don't know, but making an album and trying to sell it based on irony seems like a real long shot. It didn't sell and that was the final album of Sean Cassidy's recording career. Getting back to the Ravel sisters in American Spring, there don't seem to have been any recording sessions after about 1979. Their music went progressively from the ethereal type of thing that they did on the Spring album, more mainstream, and by their last recording sessions, it's pretty hardcore, undistinguished disco, which a lot of people fell prey to in the late 70s. The recording stayed in the can for many years until they were eventually released in 1986 in Sweden on the Swedish Ocean label and credited to The Honeys. But this is actually the unreleased spring recordings from 1973 to about 1979. At the time the album was released in 1986, some of these titles had been bootlegged and it was well known to be spring recordings rather than Honey's recordings. Unfortunately, the album has very scant liner notes, so figuring out what was what was practically impossible. It does list the writers, producers, and arrangers, and includes a paragraph describing the Honey's. As you can see, the front cover also has a mid-80s photo of the Honey's, including Ginger Blake, their cousin, along with Diane and Marilyn here. The album did come on pink vinyl, which was kind of cool. But the contents remained a bit mysterious until the 1992 release of the Honey's Capital Collector series. In addition to many early Brian Wilson produced Honey's tracks, this 20 track CD also includes everything from the Swedish It's Like Heaven album apart from 1973's Snowflakes, otherwise known as Snowflakes Fall, written by David Sandler. It's a bit of a shame because it's actually one of the highlights of this album as Spring seemed to kind of get less interesting as they went. This is the earliest thing on it and probably the best thing on it. I don't know why it isn't on the Capital Collector series. Perhaps um, Columbia still had some rights to it because it was recorded around the same time as Shine Away. I don't know. But this has liner notes and dates that kind of put this into context. According to the Capitol Collector series liner notes, Ginger Blake had overdubbed her vocals onto some of the spring recordings before they were released in Sweden, actually turning them into Honey's recordings. They're kind of uncommittal about that. I don't know their voices well enough to be able to hear if Ginger is in there along with Marilyn and Diane or not. But according to Capitol Collector series, at least some of the recordings had been overdubbed with Ginger's voice. In addition to Snowflake's Fall from the Swedish album, which we know was written, produced, and arranged by David Sandler in 1973, the Capital Collector series liner notes tell us that the following tracks were produced by Brian Wilson for Spring in 1977, during the Rocky Pamplin period. Those are Don't Be Cruel, It's Like Heaven, which on the Swedish album and the Capital Collector series is credited as being written by Brian Wilson and Diane Rovell. Rocky Pamplin is not credited, though he is credited on the Sean Cassidy Under Wraps version. Do Ya, written by Brian Wilson, Marilyn Wilson, and Diane Rovell, though that apparently at some point also had Rocky Pamplin credited as a co-writer. And Had to Phone Ya, which here is credited to Brian Wilson and Diane Rovell. On 15 Big Ones, Head to Phonia is credited to Brian Wilson, Diane Ravel, and Mike Love. I can see Mike Love's contribution was to rewrite the lyrics. The lyrics on the 15 Big Ones version of Head to Phonia are very different from the spring version. Mike simplified them. It's actually a pretty nice rewrite. Kudos to Mike. Got to give it up for you. I think you actually improved the lyrics on your rewrite of Head to Phonia for 15 Big Ones. I don't hear any male voices on any of the Rocky Pamplin period stuff that's been released. I don't know if he was mixed out of it or if he just never sang on these particular tracks, but I don't hear any evidence of Rocky Pamplin or any other male voice 
on these recordings. Also listed in the Capitol Collector Series as having been recorded in October 1977 is a disco-fied version of Dennis Wilson's Slip On Through from the Sunflower album. I think that that 1977 date for Slip On Through is an error for two reasons. One, it simply doesn't sound like a recording made in 1977. It's got all the disco tropes that were just being defined at that point. It really sounds more like something that would have been recorded in 1978 or 1979. Also, the production credit is Diane Ravel, and the arrangement credit is Elmo Peeler. All of the other recordings with that credit are from 1978. Also from 1978 and produced by Diane Ravel are Sweet Sunday Kind of Love, and Mike Love's She's Just Out to Get You. The album and CD also include the 1979 disco-fied version of Just Like Romeo and Juliet produced by Brian Wilson. Here it's called Romeo and Juliet. Obviously it's a long and complicated tale. I'm sure there are other recordings out there that haven't been released. Let me know if I got some of this wrong, if I missed anything. I think it's really interesting. Please comment, please like and subscribe. We hope to see you next time. Thanks. Bye.